All right, here we are, first and second Peter, a message for today's church from Peter the Apostle. This is lesson number eight, actually the last lesson in this series. And the title of this lesson is Be Ready. And today we're going to be looking at second Peter uh, chapter three to finish out this epistle. So um, we said that Peter is writing what is to be his uh, last sermon to the uh, churches. And in this letter he reviews uh, some key ideas that he hopes that they will remember and practice after he, is, after he is gone. Now while they were alive, the apostles, you know, they, were the, they were the source of God's word for Christians. They were, uh, you could say, they were living, breathing, walking Bibles. But after their death, the church was left with God's word in written form, uh, mostly by the apostles, to provide the way of salvation and growth and encouragement. So we don't have the apostles anymore, but we have their, we have their inspired writings. Peter's letter, um, the one that we're um, looking at, summarizes what Christians needed to observe if they wished to remain faithful to Christ and thus guarantee their entry into heaven. So far we've studied three important teachings that Peter left for the disciples of Jesus to understand and practice. First idea, you must continue to grow and develop as a Christian or you will die spiritually. This, he said, is accompanied by, um, or accomplished rather, by deliberately cultivating the Christian virtues of knowledge and purity, self-control, um, patience, kindness, love, so on and so forth. Now he doesn't explain how to do this, just that they needed to do this thing, they needed to practice these virtues in order to grow spiritually. Now we know that Christian virtues are cultivated through obedience to the word and service to other people, prayer, praise, evangelism, study, fellowship. In doing these type of things that I've just mentioned, uh, a Christian develops the virtues that uh, Peter is talking about. The very things, uh, uh, as I mentioned, that through the church we exercise. You know, we wonder, why do we have fellowship events? And why do we have Bible studies? And why do we have you know, two or three Bible studies each week? Why do we have a variety of studies, uh, service projects, uh, opportunities, opportunities to worship, and so on and so forth? These are the types of activities that cultivate these virtues of knowledge and purity and self-control and patience and so on and so forth. This, this, this is how we kind of gain these type of uh, virtues. And so the purpose for our going and being part of the church is to cultivate the very things that Peter talks about so we can continue our growth in this age and thus assure our own entry into heaven. So today you know, we're no different. We're, we're, we're following Peter's instructions in order to uh, grow in these virtues and in growing in these kinds of virtues we get to know God more perfectly and thus assure ourselves an entry of heaven. Now if we understood how all of what we do here as members of the congregation fit into the kind of the big picture as Peter describes it, it might make more sense and provide a little bit more uh, motivation. So it's not just coming to church or fixing a meal or avoiding bad habits. It's about spiritual growth and, and making sure that it's happening in our lives so that we can assure our entry into heaven. All right, so number one uh, big idea that uh, Peter uh, talks about in this final epistle, uh, you have to grow spiritually uh, or you will, you will die. You have to continue this process or else you will regress. Uh, number two big idea, uh, the Bible is inspired. The Bible is inspired. Peter encouraged them to remain faithful to God's word. Now he had two groups who needed um, convincing of this. Uh, for the Jews who had become Christians, the scriptures were what Moses and the prophets had written. For the Gentiles who had become Christians, their pagan gods, had, you know, they had never actually written anything. You know, they, they didn't have the scriptures uh, in their mindset. So Peter reminds them that he and the other apostles had actually seen the miracles and the resurrection of Jesus, had actually heard the words spoken by God Himself. And so 
For the Jews, this meant that God was now speaking through Jesus and His apostles who provided written records of Jesus' teaching. So they could, you know, they could understand this idea because they were groomed, they were taught, they were disciplined in the, in, in the idea that God had provided written records of His will and His purpose uh, through, the, uh, um, through the prophets, through Moses, and so on and so forth. So they, they had a, an idea of this. For them, the challenge was to accept that now uh, uh, these inspired writings were coming from the apostles themselves and those uh, to whom God had given uh, the message of the uh, uh, gospel. For the Gentiles, this was a new phenomenon, uh, but it was proven to them by powerful signs. You know, God speaks and was spoken through these men called apostles. These Gentiles witnessed the miracles that these apostles had uh, performed, witnessed the apostles you know, uh, empowering others to do miracles, and thus, uh, because of this type of witness, uh, would more readily accept the idea that the apostles were also providing uh, inspired uh, writings, inspired information uh, for them. So Peter reminds them that a new standard has been established through himself and the other apostles, uh, a standard and an authority that superseded Moses and the prophets as well as the rules of their uh, for the Gentiles anyways, uh, uh, superseded the rules of their pagan uh, religion. So both Jews and Gentiles who had become Christians had to accept the idea that now there was a new standard. Uh, the writings of the apostles were the standard for uh, religion, spiritual life, morality, and so on and so forth. So the new standard is God's word contained in the apostolic writings. This was to be their guide from now on. Uh, a third idea. Uh, beware of false teachers. Be very careful of false teachers. Because the church had been led exclusively by inspired teachings, relayed, uh, relaying God's word to them, they would be especially vulnerable to the uninspired teachers who would come in and preach false doctrine to them. You know, they were not used to dealing exclusively with written material. You know, while the apostles were alive, while they were there, they knew who Peter was and who Paul was and who the other, you know, they knew who these men were. But now, as these men would eventually die off, they would have to rely strictly on the writings of these individuals for guidance, and they weren't always used to that. While the apostles were alive, they could discern who was true from who was false, but now they had to be careful and compare and judge their teachers and their teachings according to the accuracy of their teaching in comparison with the scriptures. You know, when Peter was there, it was Peter. But once Peter was gone, a new teacher would come along and teach, and the church had to decide the quality and the value of that person's teaching based on what had been written before by the apostles. So this was the way they were to uh, judge uh, the accuracy of the teaching in comparison to the scripture, any discrepancies between their lifestyle and their teaching, that was another way. If, if a teacher came along you know, and he was teaching one thing but living another way, they had to be careful of that. Or also, what kind of motivation did these new teachers have? Were they motivated by spiritual things, by serving the Lord, by teaching uh, as accurately as possible the things that had already been given in the Old Testament and in the new, if you wish, by the apostles? Or were they motivated by greed or money or lust and so on and so forth? So you know, beware of false teachers. It's, it's going to happen. This was important because God would not only punish the false teachers, but, as Peter said, would also punish those who became unfaithful to the Lord because of the false teachers. All right, so that was the third big idea. Grow or die, the Bible is inspired, and beware of false teachers. So one uh, other message he's going to give them in this uh, final letter, and it is, do not be discouraged, be ready. You know, these Christians uh, that Peter is writing to lived at a time where Christianity was being publicly persecuted and many of their leaders were being put in jail and executed. 
And so in addition to this, there were false teachers that were infiltrating the church, trying to destroy it from within. So it was a, it was a troubling time, it was a difficult time. So in response to these problems, Peter says, don't be discouraged. I mean, you know, the natural response to all this trouble would be to be discouraged. <coughs> Excuse me. So he says, in face of all these problems, don't be discouraged. How are you going to react? Well, be ready. Work on being ready. And as far as Peter is concerned, being ready, ready for what? You know, well, ready, you know, ready for the return of the Lord. And so being ready meant two things. One, being ready meant being faithful until the end. <clears throat> Excuse me. So their detractors mocked uh, Christians and what they mocked was their hope of a return of Jesus. And Peter tells them not to lose this hope of his eventual uh, return because of their discouragement, because of the persecution, so on and so. Don't let all of that wear you down where you uh, will begin to lose the hope that you have that Jesus will return one day. So let's uh, pick up chapter three and read verses one and two. Peter writes, this is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. So he himself has written twice to encourage and motivate them by remembering what the prophets and what Jesus through the apostles have told them. So this is, you know, we're studying his second letter. Peter says right here, this is the second time I'm writing you. So we're historically, we're in good shape here uh, reading his second letter. Now he talks about the commandment. Well, the commandment that they received from the apostles, from you know, the writings of the apostles uh, uh, and, 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 the, and the words of Jesus that the apostles had recorded, the commandment that they had all spoken uh, to them was to remain faithful. You know, uh, the prophets continually reminded the Israelites to remain true to God and not fall into idolatry. I mean, this was the first command, wasn't it? And Jesus told His disciples that they needed to be faithful until the end in order to receive the crown, Matthew 10, verse uh, 22. And so not just beginning faithful, as was the case, these were uh, fairly new Christians, uh, you know, he says that that's okay, you, you're, you're, you've confessed your faith, you've been baptized, you're, you're starting your faith, you're starting your Christian life, and that's good. You know, that's good, but I want you to be able to finish your faith, finish the life of faith that you began. And so he continues in verse three and he says, know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by His word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So he encourages them, of course, not to be discouraged in the face of persecution that they faced because of their belief. Some, he says, may mock their belief in the return of Jesus and the end of the world at His coming. Now, now he's making kind of a parenthetical statement. He's saying, those who do this, you know, mock them for hoping for Jesus' return, those who do this forget that at one time others mocked Noah as he prepared for the end of life on earth at God's word. And what happened? Well, the rain eventually came, right? It took a century. But the, the rain finally came and destroyed all of these mockers and unbelievers. This time, Peter says, by God's word, once again there will be destruction, but this time all heaven and earth will be destroyed by fire, taking away the ungodly. So, Peter is simply repeating the same type of prophecy that God gave to Noah. And that was that Noah was to continue building the ark, if you wish, and to remain faithful 
and at, the, at, at God's timing, the flood came and destroyed the world and, and saved Noah and his family and so on and so forth. Well today, we're not building the ark, right? We're not actually building a boat. What are we building? Well, the boat we're building is called the kingdom of heaven on earth, called the church. We're building that boat. That's the boat we're building. And Peter says, don't, don't, you know, don't be worried about the mockers, don't be worried about those who disbelieve, who continue in the world and who think you're foolish, you know, you're building this boat, what's the point? You know? Peter is saying the very same thing is going to happen. At a time that only God knows, there'll be destruction, except this time it's not going to be a destruction by water, this time it'll be destruction by intense heat, by fire. So the judgment came at Noah's time and just as certainly the final judgment will come again when Jesus returns. Why? Because God has said so. That's why. Let's continue on in verse 8. He says, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So here he's providing an answer to those who mock, saying that the return of Christ and by implication His resurrection, that's really what they're getting at, is not true because nothing is happening. Everything is just you know, same old, same old. So people today, you know, they think that uh, the same thing because there is evil in the world and injustice and illness and tragedy. It must mean that God is not there. Or if He is there, He doesn't care, or His promise of justice and relief are not true because His, His coming is delayed. But Peter says two things about this type of thinking. First, God's time frame is different than our time frame. We need to understand that God is eternal and we are temporal. So something that takes 10 human years or 100 human years to accomplish His purpose that may be a lot to us, but is inconsequential to, to God. All He does is with an eternal purpose, an eternal view. That's what the thousand years represents here. It represents eternity. And so everything that God does is with a, a, an eternal view, a thousand year view and purpose. And so it is difficult for us who live a mere 75 to 100 years to understand or imagine all that God is planning and all that God is doing. We're just limited. We just can't get our minds around it. We live max 100 years or so, right? And He's eternal. So much of what we do now, when I say we, I mean you and I and faithful members of God's body, much of what we do now may only bear fruit in 100 years from now or 400 years from now. And only God knows this. This is why we must have faith. You know, Gutenberg, when he, when he came out with the printing press, he could imagine some of the things that would happen. But could he imagine the internet that still uses printing, right, to a certain extent, this idea of print? Could he even imagine what would be taking place? Could he even imagine you know, a million Bibles a day being produced? He, he couldn't imagine those things. Well, in the same way, a lot of what we do, we, we can't imagine the outcome because it's in God's hands. So the second thing Peter says to these mockers is that God is patient and the slowness of judgment is not out of indifference, but it's out of love. God is willing to wait decades for repentance because He knows that the punishment will be eternal and He doesn't want anyone to suffer eternally. Only a fool, however, will tempt God and make Him wait when He knows what it is He has to do. All right, let's keep going. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. So his readers are not to doubt that with time, and that is God's own good time, the judgment will come. And when it comes, it'll be sudden. There'll be no chance for repentance and the judgment will be complete. Everything will be destroyed by intense heat. So to the mockers who are you know, 
saying to them, wow, it's the same old, same old, he's not coming, why, you fool, you're fools for waiting. Uh, Peter reminds his readers that uh, they should not worry, God will come and when it'll happen, it'll be sudden and it'll be complete, just like the flood. All of a sudden it started to rain. All of a sudden it started to rain. And when it started to rain and they shut themselves into the ark, that was the end. There was no hope beyond that. He continues, verse 11 says, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. One more verse here. But according to His promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which right, uh, righteousness dwells. So here, Peter repeats his original exhortation by reminding them that since these things are going to happen, they're sure, then you know, the believers, his readers, since these things are sure, they need to be faithful. You know, their faithfulness demonstrated in holy conduct and godly character. So unlike the mockers and the sinners, Christians should look forward to this thing happening. Now here, hasten the day. Hasten doesn't mean that they can make it happen faster. There's some people that think that they can force God to make this happen faster. Here, the hastening of the day, it means be eager for it. Anticipate this, this time. So for disbelievers and sinners and the unfaithful, it'll be a time of complete and terrible destruction. But for Christians, it will mean a new beginning. The old sinful world will be done away with and a new dimension or world that is in complete harmony with God will emerge. God will reign with Christ and the Holy Spirit and all those who are there will be equipped with glorified bodies that will be able to stand in the presence of God without fear, without shame forever. This is something that is worth waiting for, worth hoping for. Why? Because it's a guarantee from God. So if, this thing, if these things be so, Peter says, his first admonition is that they should be ready by being faithful until the end. So how do I, you know, how do I, um, how do I react to this mocking and to this persecution? You know, do I fight back? Do I march? You know, but Peter says the way to react is to be ready. Just, just keep on working at being ready for the return of Christ. All right. So being ready um, meant being faithful. Okay? How, how do I demonstrate my readiness? Well, I'm faithful. I work at being faithful. Another thing, how do I demonstrate my readiness? Number two, by being fruitful until the end. You cannot be faithful unless you're fruitful. This was the idea that he began with and this is the idea that he ends here. The way to remain faithful until the end is not just to wait until the end, but to grow until the end. So let's read verse 14, shall we? 14 and 15. He says, therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent uh, to be found by Him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Since they look forward to the end, they should therefore cultivate these qualities that will guarantee this outcome. Note the word diligent again. Remember at the beginning, <laughs> you know, in, in all diligence, right? Add to your faith. He finishes with diligence again. You have to work at it to be at peace with God and man, to live in a pure and holy way not to give in to doubters and mockers, but to accept God's timetable and slowness of coming as an opportunity for salvation, not indifference. Verse 15 to 17, he says, Just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures, to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. So these same things, 
that Peter writes to them about, right, to be faithful and so on and so forth, these same things have also been written about by Paul the Apostle as well. And so Peter encourages them to accept his writings as authoritative as well and not be seduced by the false teachers who not only teach false doctrine, but they also pervert the teachings of the apostles as well. And, and so in this letter, Peter is including Paul in that group of inspired writers. So being fruitful means um, uh, uh, growing in the kind of knowledge that will be able to discern and reject false teachings. So be steadfast. How are you going to be steadfast? How are you going to be ready? Well, by being faithful. Uh, and then, and, and how, are you going, how else are you going to be you know, ready? Well, by being fruitful, all right? So being fruitful, as I said, means growing in this kind of knowledge um, that'll be able to know the difference between right and wrong and, and you know, growing in the knowledge to enable you to be able to discern between a true teacher and a false teacher. So a final word here in verse 18, he says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So a final word that echoes the beginning of the letter where his prayer is that they grow in the knowledge and the grace of the Lord. That's how he started, right? So growth in the knowledge of God and in His blessings guarantee a successful life as a Christian here on earth and entry into the new heavens and earth that God has provided. So let's kind of summarize uh, this information, shall we? Peter finishes his last sermon to an embattled church with a clear call to face opposition by being ready, not by being discouraged. For Christians then and now, being ready meant two things, and that is, number one, being faithful, and number two, being fruitful. 2,000 years have gone by, and still the Lord has not come. And as we look out into the world, what do we see? There is injustice, there are tragedies. There are sinners who are bold in their practices. And religion is once again being discarded and mocked and even presented in a subtle kind of way, uh, or not presented, but persecuted in a subtle kind of way, right? We're, we're taking a prayer out of school, out of public life. We're, we're making sure that Christianity has the least impact as possible. Uh, on society, we, we develop laws. This is a kind of soft type of persecution. And so what shall our answer be in the modern day to these type of, to these, these type of things? Well, first of all, we must be faithful with the attitude that even if it takes 10,000 more years for Jesus to come, God is in charge and we are prepared to wait our entire lives and beyond. You know, we have to kind of make that decision. Every day I make the decision. Today I continue in my faith, no matter what. I continue in my faith, no matter what. And then secondly, we must be fruitful in patience and knowledge and holy living, in perseverance and godliness, kindness and love, in order to maintain our faith until the end and help others find faith so they also can be saved. So I, you know, we've got our work cut out for us. We're not just sitting around waiting for the Lord to come. We have our work cut out for us. Remaining faithful requires effort, diligence. Knowing God requires effort as we cultivate these, these virtues to know Him. But the reward is the more we know Him, the stronger we become in our faith. And the stronger we become in our faith, the more fruitful we become in our lives, in our Christian lives. And the more fruitful we are in our Christian lives, it kind of, you know, it works on each other, the more faithful we become. And the stronger is our hope, the stronger is our hope, well then the, the stronger our joy and uh, anticipation of the Lord's coming. So if you've been discouraged or unfaithful, unfruitful, remember the warnings of God and be encouraged uh, by the promises that He has made and, and let's, let's use you know, first and second Peter as a guide uh, to live faithfully in this world 
until Jesus comes for us you know, in the second coming or until we go to Him in our own, uh, at the time of our death. Either way, uh, we want to be found faithful. Okay, so there you go, First and Second Peter. I hope it's been uh, helpful, encouraging. I hope that it has built your faith. Uh, if it's been good, then I encourage you to, to pass it on, uh, to point people in the direction of the, uh, the video lessons that are uh, on our BibleTalk.tv website, and then eventually this will be transferred into, transformed rather, into a book. So thank you for your attention and God bless you.